Great, okay, well, so um, on our first week we had a look at, there we go, we had a look at the Western Four, which are these four windows here on our Western Wall, um, and how they reflect the themes of King, Bishop, Soldier, and Pioneer. Um, and uh, we talked about our heritage as St. Paul's Church, as the first church of Auckland, the first stone church building in New Zealand, the first Anglican parish in New Zealand, and a whole bunch of other firsts that we represent. Uh, and there was a slide when I was talking about the bishop section and our heritage as a church uh, that I couldn't find, and I managed to find it while researching for this week. There we go. So here's a photograph from 1901 of the Anglican Synod about to meet in the St. Paul's Sunday School, which is our crypt downstairs. And I think that's a brilliant photo. Um, and it, I think it's a bit of a, an early panorama, kind of stitching together a few images, but there you go. Um, so then last week we looked at our rose window and the aisle windows. We looked at um, the kind of the history of the rose and the significance of rose windows generally in churches. And uh, we looked at the apostles and the evangelists and how they're represented in our aisles. Um, and that was last week. This week I'm going to have a talk about uh, the memorial windows. So we're looking then at the two chapels, the Lady Chapel and the Requiem Chapel, so Lady Chapel, Requiem Chapel, um, and also the Sanctuary at the far end. And so that's quite a bit to cover because we've got far more windows in this section than in either of the other two. Um, but I thought I kind of missed, missed a trick here because I hadn't even explained how stained glass is made in the first place. Um, so it's a little late to the party. Uh, and this isn't historical research. This is just me doing a little bit of Googling and, uh, and, how, and tying things in uh, with what I've read in my research. But stained glass is made roughly like this. Um, glass is, well, the, the design is drawn up, um, a full-scale design is on paper, and then they cut the glass to fit the shapes that they want, uh, and then they paint those uh, individual pieces of glass, and then they gently place them in a uh, kiln, and uh, they're gently heated until the glass melts enough to fuse with the paint, but not so much that it distorts the image. Uh, and the painting is done with uh, this black ink, which is actually a manganese oxide. And the sharp, crisp lines are called trace lines, and the shading areas are called matting. And uh, because they don't want matting to mix with trace lines, normally they will do one, and they will fire it. And when it's cooled, they will then do the other and fire it. The very skilled people will mix uh, manganese oxide, some with honey water and some with uh, terps, and so that they don't mix on the, because one's spirit-based, one's water-based, and then they don't mix on the paint but that's, um, that's for the more skilled. And then you can just do it in one, in one go and fire at once. Um, silver chloride is also used to um, produce like a, this yellow coloring, actually. There we go, that's created by silver chloride, which is done on the opposite side to the manganese oxide. Um, medieval glass, uh, each piece was an individual color. But post-medieval, when they started creating stained glass windows after the medieval era, kind of there was a new technology which was uh, flashing and what they did is they would take plain glass and they would fuse a pigment to just one side. And the advantages with that is that you, could, um, you can use acids to erode some of the pigment so that you can fade out a tone. Whereas with the pot metal glass, the original kind of stained glass, everything was just a solid color. So there's two types going on there. And, uh, and it opened up a whole new uh, kind of realm of possibilities of what you could do with your stained glass images. Um, so here's some examples. You've got some matting there in the middle um, and some of the acid treatments. Sometimes they use wax to guide where the acids are and, and uh, so that when they apply the acids, it doesn't affect certain areas, but it does others. And stained glass windows are also made in uh, rectangular panels so that they can be easily transported and then quickly installed uh, in the window. <coughs> so they're not all one complete piece. And uh, the bars that join them together are called saddle bars. All right, so and there you go. Uh, and when, when you look at stained glass in the dark, which you have ample opportunity to this evening, um, you can see the, uh, the lead lines quite clearly. And you can see you know, the, the detail and the intricacy with which they've put the, the glass together. Uh, incidentally, another thing that you can see in the dark that you can't really see in the light is the texture of the glass itself. If you look at any of our windows where the light is um, bouncing from them, you'll see there's a whole number of textures and types of glass involved. Uh, and all of that just adds to the effect of the overall window. Okay, so um, let's have a look at this. This is Walter Hickson's scheme. This is where we kind of finished last week. Walter Hickson was a vestryman at St. Paul's, and in 1939, towards the end of the year, he came up with a scheme for all of the windows in this church. Uh, at the time, uh, there were very few of them were actually stained, and he had this suggestion, and we looked at this last week, so I'm not going to go into it in detail, but he suggested that the first 12 windows in our aisle be the 12 apostles, that we put uh, Melchizedek, Moses, and a couple other characters in these four here, um, and... 
then he also had a plan for all of these clerestory windows, this top layer here, which is currently all plain glass. Uh, he even had a, an idea for the rose to replace the cathedral glass. Um, but what I didn't share is his plan for the chapels. And in the Lady Chapel, he envisaged uh, St. Anne and St. Mary, the Blessed Virgin and Child, and, and the three lights, the Adoration of the Magi. And what's interesting is that three of those were actually completed, according to his scheme. In the Requiem Chapel, he wanted a Good Shepherd window on the west wall and the Workshop of Nazareth to fill the main window. And one of these uh, was completed. Okay, here we go. And in the sanctuary, uh, his, this was his design for the sanctuary windows. He wanted a pelican, uh, the sacrament to fill the two uh, trefoils, that's the three-leaf clover-type windows, um, St. Luke and St. Mark in the two lancets, and Te Deum Laudamus uh, in the main east window. Now, two of those, the pelican and Te Deum, are quite unfamiliar to us. So uh, Te Deum I'll talk about later, but the pelican is actually quite a common image in stained glass because uh, according to Christian tradition, the pelican was believed to pierce itself and feed its young with its own blood. And so this became, it's not actually true. If you, uh, if you Google it, you'll find that it's a complete fiction. But it was a nice idea. And, uh, and it kind of captured the imagination of the medieval world. And so the pelican became a real symbol for Christ, shedding his blood for his children. Uh, and so you do see the pelicans appear quite often in uh, church history art and in some old stained glass as well. But we never had a pelican. Um, the Requiem Chapel. So I'm now going to have a look at the chapels in turn and the windows within those chapels in turn, and hopefully uh, we can get to the end and people will be enlightened. So um, our first window is the Thomas window. Uh, the base plate reads, uh, in memoriam, Evan Crichton Thomas, the people's warden from 1916 until his death, October 4th, 1937, aged 80 years, a faithful servant, rest in peace. Now the window depicts the good shepherd. Uh, so it was the one that uh, Hickson suggested. Um, and such a choice is typical when commemorating a vestryman or a church warden. Uh, another popular choice alternative is um, the light of the world. And this is an example of a light of the world window by the same company that produced our Good Shepherd window. Um, it ties in with the others on the wall, with the Western Four, as I've been calling them. It has a canopy over the top in kind of a medieval style uh, with a deep red background. Um, and along the base, it has this kind of uh, enlarged base plate. It's not as large as the Western Four, but it's, it is a thick scroll, which kind of, again, gives it this um, yeah, synergy with the other Western Four windows that came long before it. Um, there is an oddity about the window, though, and you can see it here, and that is the head of the lamb. Um, we know it's a lamb, and kind of when you look at the window, you don't think about it, but now that I've told you, you probably can't see much else because it doesn't really seem to have much of a head. I'm not quite sure whether it's supposed to be looking up in the face of Jesus or whether he's kind of buried his face into his armpit. Um, but either way, it's just slightly odd. Uh, and I think the position of the saddlebars doesn't help either. Uh, but the window itself is a high-quality one. It was made by Robert Fraser in Dunedin. It's the only window that we have by him. Um, Fraser attended the Royal College of Art London. Uh, at the time, it was considered to be the finest industrial art college in the world. He also trained as a glass painter in London before returning to Dunedin in 1893. Uh, Fraser designed and patented his own kiln to fire paint, painted glass and produced distinctive and elaborate stained glass for the mansions of the city's wealthy. In 1907, he won the gold medal for the highest award for ecclesiastic and domestic stained glasswork in New Zealand, uh, beating European windows that had been imported for the competition. And this uh, gave a big boost to his reputation, and from that time onwards, he was uh, quite widely sought for his windows. Fraser died in 1947, and our window was installed in 1941, which makes it one of the later period of his 54-year career. Um, also in the Requiem Chapel, we have this window. It's the, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, so please excuse me if I do, but Endine or Endian? Endine. Okay, I've been told it's Endine, the Endine family window. Um, it's a, it kind of represents the key stages of Christ's life in six narrative scenes. You have his birth, his flight to Egypt, the, his baptism, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and finally, above them all, his present identity as the Lamb of God. Don't worry, if you're squinting, you'll be able to see them much clearer in a moment. Yeah, I can see some relieved faces. Like, you got all that from that? <laughs> um, 
Now, it may seem odd. If you were only going to pick six things to represent the whole life of Jesus, why would you pick the flights to Egypt and none of his miracles? Um, but actually, when you look at it, you realize that each of the windows are in pairs. So the bottom two refer to him as an infant, the middle two, his life as an adult, and the top two, his life post-mortem. And then the seventh top window is his heavenly existence. So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail here. So again, you have the birth of Jesus, the flight to Egypt, uh, his baptism, his crucifixion, the resurrection, and his ascension. And they're beautiful windows and uh, lovely colors. And right at the top, you have the Lamb of God quatrefoil, kind of tying them together. Each of the images has a scripture, reference, a scripture verse underneath it, which describes what's going on in the image. So our window was donated in memory of Ellen and John Endeen, who died in 1910 and 1925. Endeen was a renowned early Auckland family, uh, back to high colonial days, who have subsequently run successful businesses downtown. And in the words of Evan Lewis, who I've referred to many times, they had the shekels for such things. Um, the last point of interest, now we come to the fascinating slide, the last point of interest worth mentioning is that this window is not the original design. Um, there was an artist called Margaret Harvey who, grew up, who drew up a completely different image, um, which I've seen, but Bishop Simkin objected to it on account that the fingers were too elongated. <laughs> Sadly, we couldn't find the image to show you, but it is safely in our folders in the office, uh, ready to pull out at an, a subsequent time. But for now, this was my best uh, <laughs> replication of the image. I know. You look at this and you wonder, how did they possibly reject such a... Such a glorious piece of art. It's the smile, yeah. So yeah, Bishop Simkin objected because the fingers were too long. He said they looked like a bunch of bananas, and he wasn't happy with it. Now, what's fascinating is that this window is what we call a White Friars or Powell and Sons window. Um, in 1834, a man called James Powell, who was an entrepreneur and a wine merchant in London, he was age 60 already, and he purchased a um, glassworks just off Fleet Street in a place called Tudor Street, or Tudor Road, I think, that had existed since 1680. Now, James had two sons, Arthur, who was 22, and Nathaniel, who was 21, and together they had no skills in glassmaking, but they set about learning the industry uh, energetically, devouting most of their energy into church stained glass production. Now, they experimented. They developed new techniques. They patented a number of ideas, and combined with the late Victorian surge in neo-Gothic exploration of church architecture, Hundreds of churches were being built up and down Britain, and it meant the business was booming, and Powell and Sons uh, became world leaders in stained glass. I think the fact that they weren't from a stained glass background gave them this kind of fresh perspective on how to approach it, and uh, as a result, they developed new ideas and new techniques um, that brought them really to the, the leading edge of stained glass. Um, one of the leaning proponents and prolific producers of neo-Gothic era was a guy called William Morris, and Powell were the people who supplied his glass. By 1950, they diversified to include domestic tableware. In 1875, Harry Powell, the grandson of the original purchaser, um, who was an Oxford graduate in chemistry, joined the firm. And his chemistry training led to a more scientific approach and innovations, and they were able to achieve previously unattainable colors and high levels of heat resistance, which branched them into all kinds of scientific glassmaking as well as in for labs and such. Um, the company's name changed to Whitefriars in 1919, and new premises were needed to accommodate the growing business. At great expense, they opened a brand new factory at Wealdstone in 1923, seen here. Now, between the wars, Art Deco was the new fashion, and heavy engraved colored glass became popular among the, among the middle and upper classes. It was around this time that Powell's brightest star, and that, incidentally, was, again, another boost to the company as they were producing lots of domestic glass. Um, around this time, James Hogan emerged. Uh, this, oh, this was just a really cool photo I found. It doesn't tie in exactly with my notes, but it was too cool to leave out. <laughs> yeah, so they call the, the drawings for the stained glass windows are called cartoons. Thank you, James. Um, now, James Powell had, sorry, um, 
James Hogan had been an apprentice at Whitefriars since he was age 15, and it was the only employer of his whole life. His influence in the area of stained glass became legendary, creating tableware, glassware, and serviceware without comparison. He also designed the windows for St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue in New York, and Liverpool Cathedral, both of which are shown there. Um, the business also spread to America, creating a third wave of prosperity for the firm. But all that changed with the onset of World War II. Glass production was restricted to that which aided the war effort. And as by the end of the conflict, Whitefriars was a business struggling to survive. Another boost came in 1951, when the Festival of Britain showcased Powell and Sons as a modern exemplars of British industry. But unfortunately for them, technology by now was able to produce um, you know, factory produced colored glass bricks. And uh, it dispensed with the need for expensive stained glass for churches who couldn't really afford it, they could do colored bricks instead. And so as a result, the whole market for stained glass dwindled. In the 1960s, the company specialized in freedom domestic glassware, since there was such a drop off in stained glass. Um, and then in the economic downturn of the 1970s, they basically lost steam. And by eight, 1981, they were bought out and the factory was bulldozed. And it's kind of sad, eh, when you hear that. It feels like a sad story, but how are we doing? Oh, yeah, we'll get there. Um, it does feel like a sad story, but Powell and Sons, or Whitefriars, as they were also known, were one of the most prolific and long-lasting of the great Victorian stained glass firms. Their domestic glassware are still highly prized collector's items, and their windows continue to beautify churches around the world. They broke new ground, created new technologies that changed the whole industry, and are famous for their vibrant and rich colors. From 1919 onwards, with the name changed to Whitefriars, a little signature emblem was introduced to the bottom right-hand corner of their windows. In a play on words, there's a tiny pane in the vicinity which will contain a cowled monk in a white robe, a white friar. And this helps identify their windows around the world, and it's now a famous trademark which they have. And this is actually a close-up photograph of the window in the Requiem Chapel. So next time you come in and the sun is shining, see if you can find them. Now, our Whitefriars window was installed in 1959, placing it towards the end of their post-war upturn, before the business's gradual decline in the last two decades. Prior to the 1920s, Powell and Sons windows were very traditional. You can see one here in one of their adverts, um, quite similar to our um, Thomas window that we looked at first, um, also similar to our Western Four Herbert Brothers windows. Um, but with the change in uh, name, the change with the new factory, um, came also a change in style. They applied a modernist twist to the medievalism of the Gothic revival. Uh, if you look closely at the glass, you can see here, uh, you'll notice many of the background panes have patterns or details painted on them to make them look like recycled fragments from previous windows. Now, this isn't actually true. It's a bit of artistic license. Um, but it just is a bit of an artistic impression that kind of harks back to this medieval time where glass was so precious it was recycled into new windows. Um, but some argue that it was a little bit false and that it clutters the image. But your opinion is your own. So that's um, the Requiem Chapel. I thought we'd now have a look at the Lady Chapel. So um, this, these are the plans drawn by William Skinner in 1893, and we're incredibly fortunate because the owner of these plans has generously brought them in for you guys to see them yourself. So they're on the altar in the sanctuary, and so during the break time, please go over and have a look, but maybe don't touch, because they are quite old and rather precious. Um, but you can see on there Skinner's original drawings for this church before it even existed. Um, and this was his design for the Lady Chapel, kind of seen from the uh, north perspective. You kind of outlined there what the Lady Chapel would have looked like. And I say would have looked like because it was never built. Um, unfortunately, funds were a little short when uh, we came to building Skinner's design. And so certain corners were cut, including basically not building the back section, um, which included the Lady Chapel, the sanctuary, and the vestry. There were a few other elements, like the spire, for example, was never built. But if you look closely, these are the windows that we would have had. And this uh, rather elaborate one on the right here would literally be two stories high. When you compare it to the other windows in the same drawing, you'd know that it would start about the same level as our aisle windows and would go all the way up to the top of our clerestory windows. So it would have been quite an impressive uh, sight from the outside. Uh, and also in the eastern face, so above the altar, would have been a full-size lancet like we had for St. Paul here by the, um, by the bell tower but uh, we also don't have that. We have a, a small lancet instead. 
Um, this is the sanctuary when it was built in 1938. And um, it was built in concrete, and it looks rather white in this uh, picture. Uh, but you can see there how actually it's quite different to um, what the design was. So we don't have a nice large window here. Instead, we have three small lights and then a little porthole, which is in the organ chamber up here. Um, and instead of having this continue all the way down to the ground, it's more of just like a little canopy that sticks out. And that's where the altar is in the Lady Chapel, just through there. Um, so we have five lights in Our Lady Chapel, a set of three and a set of two. Um, these are, we'll start with the two smaller windows. They are quite simply quite gorgeous, um, beautiful colors, and they represent um, the Blessed Virgin and Child, who is not named, but it's obvious, uh, being in the Lady Chapel. If you're ever unsure, if you see the halo has a cross in it, then it's Jesus. Um, and the other window is St. Anne, who according to tradition was the mother of Mary. It being a lady chapel, they seem like an appropriate choice. Uh, the colors are rich and the detail is crisp. The two ladies face away from each other. Mary holds her child while Anne holds a book. The geometric backgrounds are similar, but while Anna's green jagged points mirror her square checkered floor and rectangular border trim, if that makes sense, Mary's gentle red curves match the soft foliage beneath her feet and rounded semicircular border trim. Um, on the perpendicular wall is our Derbyshire window. And if we just make, take kind of a bit of a mental snapshot of that, uh, those background geometric shapes, you'll find that actually that's a bit of a trademark move for Whitefriars, and it exists in all of our Whitefriars windows, um, including the ones we looked at just a moment ago. Each of the scenes has the uh, alternating geometric background. The other windows are the Derbyshire windows, uh, called after the family that it remembers. Now, the coloring is less vibrant around the border, but a keen observer will immediately spot the same geometric background. The figures are also distinguished with red semicircles, sorry, the images are also distinguished with red semicircles on the border exterior with ye yellow semicircles on the interior for the two outer lights. In other words, let's see if I can get this working. Here, you've got red here and yellow there, whereas on the middle you've got blue here and red there. And it just helps kind of distinguish them as separate panes, but still linked. Um, there's an identical style and font of the, to the base description dedication as we saw for St. Anne's name, and all three have the same bright blue background, tying them, uh, tying them together. Now, there's a few things of interest to notice here in these pictures. Uh, in the first light on the left is the Adoration of the Magi. Joseph is holding a lamp. The Star of Bethlehem can be seen in the sky, and the small town is visible in the distance over Joseph's shoulder. Can you see all of that from where you're sitting? In the second light, you have um, Gabriel's Annunciation. Uh, Mary has her head uncovered, which differentiates her from the other two panes because at this point she is unmarried, and in the other two, she's married. Gabriel stands on a small cloud. He has a tall golden collar and cuffs and a pink halo, marking him as an angel. His wings also have rather cool blue stripes, and he holds a bunch of flowers, either because he's a well-trained man and he knows when you talk to a lady you should bring some flowers, or possibly symbolic of the new life inside Mary, or if they're lilies, uh, that was an, a symbol used in Christian iconography to refer to Mary. So it could be any of those things, really. Um, in the final light, you have the dedication at the temple. Simeon, the very well-named prophet, is standing with his uh, priestly robes on. Joseph is wearing a travel bag because they had just journeyed all the way to Jerusalem for the dedication, and he's carrying a walking stick. And Mary has two doves for the sacrifice that's mentioned in Luke 2. Um, so it all seems to be a very tidy set, but there's one unsolved mystery that we just haven't managed to solve. The windows are out of sequence. While windows depicting a single scene over several windows would commonly place the most significant aspect in the center, something we looked at with the rose window, the most important thing in the middle, and other things radiating from there, when depicting a narrative scene or a series of events, they would always be chronologically placed. So chronologically, the second window should be first, and then the third, and then the first. Mary hears the news, Jesus is dedicated within eight days old, and then the Magi visit the small child. Um, even if you follow a more traditional narrative of the nativity, you may place the Magi before the dedication at the scene of the birth, um, but either way, it would still be out of sequence. So the perplexing order doesn't detract, however, from the stunning quality of the series. All five lights, including Mary and Anne, uh, were installed together in 1951 as a unified set and were excellent choices for the chapel dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. 
as explained along the base of the Derbyshire windows, um, and St. Anne, um, sorry, it is dedicated to the Derbyshire family, while St. Anne is in the memory of Reverend Corbin, who was the fifth vicar of St. Paul's, and he, he and his wife's family. And Mary commemorates Susan Jane Dean. Now, as with the N. Dean window in the Requiem Chapel, these are Whitefriars productions, and they have the uh, cheeky little monk. Where are we? Here we go, down there in the right. There he is. I, wouldn't, I would have left these as a non-spoiler, and then you could have investigated, but it's too dark. You'll just have to do it on Sunday. By then, you'll look forgotten. Uh, bottom right is where you need to look. Um, incidentally, there's no little monk figure on either the Anne or the Mary window. Uh, the reason being, because they were installed as a set, they tended to just put it in the one or the primary bottom right-hand corner. So I was at a church in St. Andrews where there were two which were clearly a pair placed in very different parts of the church, and only one of them had a white fire stamp. And uh, when I asked Evan Lewis, who was giving the tour at the time, he explained how, because they were a set installed together, it would only be on one of the two windows. There you go. Oh, yeah. Also, what's really interesting about this series of windows is that Whitefriars themselves thought they were a little bit special. This is a 1950s catalog from Whitefriars um, that they used for essentially advertising their work. And it inc includes photographs of their work from around the world. Um, and on it is our Derbyshire windows. And it says there, St. Paul's Church, Auckland, New Zealand which is a nice little thing. So this is from someone's private collection. And that's the photograph in their ca catalog a little closer. OK, we have one more thing to cover off, and then we can take a little break. How's that sound? OK, the tram shelter. You may be wondering, which tram shelter? We don't have a tram shelter, and you'd be absolutely right, we don't. But we did. <laughs> so this was our tram shelter, which was started in 1919 and then completed in 1920. And it was built as a memorial to the troops of the First World War who had fallen, uh, particularly those from this parish. Um, this is the uh, shelter next to the church from this photograph, undated, but certainly before 1935. And uh, conveniently, whoever took this photograph scratched out the building behind uh, so that we can see it a little bit more clearly, which is great because most photographs, uh, it's really hard to see it, uh, which we'll see in just a moment. Now, um, as these photographs are showing, it was built from the same materials as the church, built in the same style as the church, um, and it was essentially an extension of the church building to serve uh, the community that used to always wait in the bell tower archway when waiting for the trams. They thought, well, let's provide them with a proper tram shelter that's also a memorial and also in style and in keeping with our church. And uh, this dedication stone, by the way, is this one, and it's in our Requiem Chapel this evening if you wanted to have a look at that in the break time. Um, which was really exciting to find, actually. We found it face down in the basement last year. Um, I went looking for it, and when you're looking for a particular stone, you can spot one in a church built of stone, which is otherwise quite hard to come across. Um, yeah, so that was there. I was pretty happy that day. Um, now, the reason I'm talking about this tram shelter is because it also contained four stained glass windows. And this is an artist's impression, actually by my mother, um, of what it looked like based on the descriptions. This is what it probably looked like on the interior from the descriptions uh, that we have. So it was built of Rangitoto, a Melbourne bluestone, like the church was, um, with uh, Omaru stone, doing the, the white stuff, essentially. There was a Tudor arch surmounting the entrance on which it said, remembering these dead, let the living be humble. And on either side, there were tablets uh, with an inscription to, um, yeah, dedicating it to the fallen. And here on the inside, uh, there was an Omaru stone frieze, which is this kind of rail that runs along the top, that had a list of 25 battles which our Anzac troops had been involved in. And in, then there were the emblems of the two Auckland battalions there. And then underneath were um, essentially polished marble stones with the names of 50 troops, who had, uh, 50, sorry, who had fallen. Now, the stained glass hadn't been installed when it was uh, opened and dedicated in August 1920, uh, sorry, in 1920 in March, but by August they had been installed, and we have this lovely description of them, the only one really, um, from the St. Paul's Parish Magazine in August. Uh, and it says, the windows give a lovely, soft, and very pleasing tone to the interior. A unique touch are the red and black oblong and diamond badges of the two Auckland battalions. Uh, these are in colored glass and form a very pleasing adornment above and below the inscriptions. The four windows bear respectively the following inscriptions. To the memory of the teachers and scholars of the church of the Sunday school. To the memory of the altar servers and choristers of the church. To the memory of all who have been worshippers in the church. And to the memory of all who have been residents in the parish. 
The two similar windows bear respectively the emblems, the Bible and sword of St. Paul. So that's the, uh, they're the dedication scripts. The Bible and sword of St. Paul, we'll use the same one as in our lancet. And the host and chalice. The two larger windows each have the arms of the diocese, which is a shield with three stars surmounted by a mitre. Now, the shelter appears in a number of photographs. Again, when you see it close to the building, it's actually quite hard to distinguish. Now, just as the Second World War was getting underway, entries in the St. Paul's Vestry Minute Book show that one of the windows was broken by November 1939, and repairs still hadn't happened by October 1940. Um, other notes suggest that the shelter was dirty and tired and in need of restoration. Um, peace was declared in Europe in May 1945, and there was a, an attempt to raise funds and build the rest of the spire as a memorial to the Second World War troops, but um, that kind of didn't succeed, and so instead they decided to renovate the um, tram shelter and include the names of the Second World War fallen onto the, onto the roll. So as part of this restoration in 1947, the windows were removed and replaced with iron grills. These are the plans for the iron grills in the Auckland archives. Uh, it's unknown whether more than one window was broken. There's no record of the other windows being broken from the vestry minutes, but there's also no records of anything that happened to the windows, or, so we just don't know. There's, there's a, a small glimmer of hope in me that somewhere, one day, we will find three St. Paul's stained glass windows, um, but it's a, a dim hope, let's be honest. Um, uh, the, uh, the service bulletin at the time said, weathered stones have been replaced, old glass has been removed from windows and replaced with iron grills. Now, over the following decades, the shelter fell into disuse, especially as the buses replaced the trams and they stopped further up the road like they do now. And so the tram shelter ended up being used as a toilet and uh, as a place for the homeless regularly. Um, it generally just became very smelly and a bit of an eyesore. And so um, the decision was made in 1971 uh, to rethink what are we going to do with the tram shelter. Incidentally, I just circled here the uh, iron railings because, interestingly, the iron grills for the windows were based on the railing pattern. Um, so Auckland Council essentially got in touch with the church. They wanted to improve um, the pavement area in front, and so what to do with the tram became an option, uh, a question, sorry. And in, uh, option one here, they essentially restore it and renovate it and leave it. In option two, they remove it and make it a bus shelter where the buses stop instead. And option three was you knock it down, and they went with number three. They knocked down the tram shelter in 1971. Uh, and they transferred the names of the fallen to a new honor roll, which is still on our requiem wall uh, today. And with that, we'll take a break. So we come to the sanctuary, or the chancel, is what we're going to have a look at. And that's basically this whole area here. So uh, the very first St. Paul's Church was built by William Mason in 1841 to 1844. And it was a uh, neo-Gothic style church. It looked like this. This is actually a painting by uh, Churton's daughter, I think. Daughter or granddaughter? Daughter. Um, so she took a little artistic flair and had a go at painting it. And you can see... Okay, so yes, yeah, so she was married to Charles Heafy, who's a, a watercolorist who painted a lot of scenes of early Auckland uh, and early Sydney as well, if you check out uh, Google for old images. Um, and so this is what the church looked like, the original St. Paul's. And... Um, I, but there was a problem. So you can see here, uh, this is kind of this sanctuary. Oh, a little feedback. This is the, uh, so you would enter in through the bell tower, and then on this side is where the altar was. Um, but the problem was this church only seated about 400 people, and the colony was growing, and it was getting busier and busier. And there's a lovely little entry in the Southern Cross newspaper in 1862. Every Sunday, the porch of St. Paul's was crowded with people, and every Sunday, they must have noticed the wardens passing in the aisles, anxious to find places for the people until not a seat could be obtained. And there's meeting notes where they're essentially they're turning people away every week, and they say, we have to extend the church so that we can accommodate this growing colony. And more people are arriving by ship every day. Um, and so in, in steps uh, Colonel Thomas Mould, who was a member of the church. He was an engineer, military engineer, uh, who used to build bridges. And he decided to extend the church without knocking it down and, with, and actually in, employed an ingenious idea. So on the left here, we have the floor plan of the original St. Paul's Church. And then on the right, we have the extended floor plan. And so what he did was he removed the side walls and extended the church out the other way, turning what was the nave into the transept. Does that make sense? 
So what it meant in effect was the altar was now on, not on the east side, but apart from that, apart from essentially the church turning 90 degrees, which clearly in St. Paul's we don't have a problem with, <laughs> um, it effectively massively extended the, the seating area of the church. It could seat 700. And this was the extended church there. Quite a beautiful building. Um, I showed that picture last week. This was the inside of the church, and it's quite hard to see, but if you look closely, you'll notice around here, you've got kind of this three lancets thing going on again. Um, I've highlighted them there so you can see them more clearly. But it was uh, the same as the original east side. They essentially replicated the same three tall lancets with the center one highest uh, at the new altar end of the church. Uh, and this is it here, and you can just about see the extension there with the three lancets. Now, if you remember from my little history about St. Paul's, what happened was Britomart Point, which used to be a cliff essentially extending out over the water, um, was discovered to have coal, and it was also discovered to be in the way of the railway line. And so they decided to get rid of it. This is a photograph of the miners literally hand-picking Britomart Point away and taking it away in horse-drawn carts. And the, all the soil and was used as landfill to extend the harbor area. So our harbor area in Auckland is actually a false harbor, uh, and it's Britomart Point thrown into the sea. And you can see in this photograph, which is a fantastic image, St. Paul's just teetering on the precipice of uh, the Britomart excavations. And this really is about as far as the excavation got. I'll point out a few things. You've got um, horse and carts carrying uh, debris up and down the roads here. You've got mechanized mining going on here as they're uh, digging these deep channels into the, the, the rock face. And up here, you've got the higher level um, uh, mining going on up here. And you can see how close St. Paul's got to the edge. And, uh, and it was thought that they had kind of stopped early enough and the church would be okay. But engineers' reports were confirming that it was just not safe anymore. And so the decision was made to demolish St. Paul's Church in, uh, 1894, uh, in 1884. Sorry. It's rather sad, isn't it, that image? But it's, um, it's good that we've got some kind of keepsake from it. Um, so when Skinner designed the new chancel, bearing in mind we're talking about the chancel, he had the same three lancets here again at the chancel end, uh, kind of in memorial of the, my guess is at least, in the similar style to the St. Paul's that had gone before. Um, but since the chancel was never built, there was a temporary wooden chancel, which you can see here, uh, for the first few decades of this church's life. And um, the altar had three lancets, as you can see. This is an interior shot from 1900, and it shows you the wooden uh, altar. And it went back about uh, just beyond where those uh, stone arches are currently. It was about that deep. So it was reasonably deep. Uh, there's a couple of more detailed shots here of the inside of the chancel when it was uh, the wooden temporary one. And although you can hardly see it, I've just highlighted this hanging lamp here, which is now hanging in Our Lady Chapel. It's a bra well, copper uh, oil lamp, which used to hang directly above the old altar. Uh, here's a photograph of it. You can get a good sense of the depth of the whole thing um, from this picture from 1905, decorated for Easter. Incidentally, some of these railings as well, not in this shot, but actually at the back there, uh, when they removed the temporary sanctuary, they kept the railings and they installed them at the front of the Requiem Chapel. So those small little uh, rails that you go past to go in there are actually from the original wooden chancel. And if you look at the back of them, you'll see that the design has been cut into uh, if they had been designed to fit that space, they would have stopped short and had a border like the rest of the railwood. Just a little detail if you like hunting for these things. So um, when they came to designing the sanctuary, um, fortunately, funds were tight again. It seems to be a recurring theme whenever we come to St. Paul's building projects. Um, and so Skinner's designs were considered to be uh, just impractical, really, to try and complete Skinner's grand design. The year was 1915. 1914, excuse me, and um, they were hoping to build it, but they didn't get beyond just doing the foundations. They were interrupted by the Great War and then an economic depression, and so they had the chancel redesigned by a guy called Daniel Patterson, uh, and this was his plan here. And as you can see, he's also got three lancets uh, in his main east window with some tracery above it. So this is kind of a reoccurring theme that was going on, and this is actually what was built. Interestingly, while this was the... Um, shortened, cheaper version. Uh, they decided they couldn't build it in stone because that was too expensive, so they built it out of concrete. And if you look here, there's also this big X through this whole transept uh, because they literally just decided after drawing the plans they couldn't afford to build one of the wings. And so our vestry and everything beneath it is actually still the original wooden section from the original wooden 
chancel, and I'll show you a photograph of that in a moment. Right now, in fact. There we go. So that's the original um, woodwork and weatherboard, and you can see how it was uh, married up against some stonework that was never intended to be left like that. Um, and uh, this, incidentally, is the gent's toilet, if you're looking for kind of references. Uh, this dodgy little thing sticking out the side is actually this little room here. So when you slip from the sanctuary into the vestry and you think you're making a cheeky little maneuver, that's fine, but this is actually what you're walking through, <laughs> supported by one little plank. So bear that in mind the next time the kids want to run through there and you think it's all, all fine and dandy. Uh, and you can see the concrete um, chancel there that was built. Um, if you're interested in the little details, the, uh, the outside of our east window is, uh, extends out from the wall because the aim was to cover the sanctuary in stone to keep it in, in keeping with the rest of the building. And you can see how uh, they, they faced it so that they can then just add stones in here later. And uh, the edges of the east window are kind of, um, well, almost castellated so that they would marry up with the stone and then it would finish flush once the stone was added. You'll also notice there are these um, big beams that kind of stick out of the wall. They're not so clear on this photograph. They're a little clearer here. Uh, and these are essentially there um, periodically to support the weight of the stone. They're almost like shelves on which you would then build the stone uh, and support it upwards. Um, so this was the sanctuary when it was completed in 1936, 38, sorry. And um, it's pretty cool. It's very similar to what we have today. There's a few differences. These uh, little stone walls, for example, used to exist here. And uh, while we don't have them now, if you look down here on these pillars, you'll see the scars from where they used to be. So that's something else you can have a look at. Um, and incidentally, these stairs here, these are all stone. And from there backwards, it's cowrie planking, like we have in Our Lady Chapel and on our floor in the sanctuary. And these stairs also continue all the way across to this pillar here underneath this platform. So hopefully one day we can get rid of this 1970s green carpet and have polished carry floors and original stone. Would be my hope, but we'll see, see what happens. Um, the floor layout of the um, sanctuary was also quite different then. They had steps leading up to the altar. The altar was built out of stone, actually from the old post office that used to be down on Princess Street. When they demolished that, they used the stone to build our altar, and it was up hard against the wall. And you can see where the, the trimming here on the wall kind of goes up where the altar was just here at the far end. And, uh, and then we had the tracery and the mullions in the uh, window. Now, it's not known for sure where Daniel Patterson got his inspiration from for this design, but one theory is that he kind of poached it from the Parsons Handbook. Now, the Parsons Handbook was a very common and popular guide at the time. It was essentially a neo-Gothic how-to on uh, Anglican churches in terms of vestments, furniture, the layout of the buildings. Essentially, how do you build a correct Anglican church? And this is their impression of a correct, ideal Anglican chancel. And uh, it's very similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's very similar in a lot of ways, particularly in the placing of all of these, which have various fancy names, piscinery and all kinds of stuff, but they're all exactly the same and in the same place. Uh, the layout of the floor, the levels, the steps, the placement of the altar, the placement of two statues either side of the main window, uh, the low walls, all of these things are all the same in the Parsons Handbook as they are in Daniel's drawing. So it's, it's very possible that he was at least inspired by the Parsons Handbook. This is what it looked like in the 1950s, I think, back when they were old pews. Oh, and incidentally, these are the railings I was referring to that were later cut down and put next to the Requiem Chapel. So we come there, now that we understand the story of the chancel itself, I think we can properly appreciate the east window. We see how it's been this kind of running theme of lancets, but when we come to our window, obviously we have something quite different from it. So this is a, well, the cartoon for our east window, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to show you this. I received this image about three days ago when I managed to get in touch with the son of the artist who made this window while doing some research. And he very kindly was, uh, provided me with this and a couple of other images from his archives. Um, and he was absolutely thrilled to know uh, that we were able to kind of compare notes. And he never knew that some of our windows were actually completed. He only had sketches for them. So he was really thrilled to hear from us and to, and to get photos of the windows in place and everything else. His name is Stephen Lee, and he's been uh, very, very helpful. He said he's got some more material, which is in archives, which he couldn't access yet. But hopefully in the future, we'll have some other goodies that we can pull out as well. But that's the, the drawing that, Stephen Lee uh, that Lawrence Lee produced. And this is the actual window here. Lawrence Lee uh, was the head of the stained glass department for the Royal College of Art in London, which was the same place that um, Fraser trained at when he, the guy who did the Thomas window that we started with. Uh, and it's a very, very prestigious school for stained glass. Um, 
this is our glorious window in the daylight. And, uh, and obviously it shows um, Jesus in the middle. Uh, you've got Mary on one side, St. Paul on the other. You've got the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove above him. And uh, you've got this kind of geometric design and pattern going on. And a lot of uh, leaded plain glass in the background. Uh, a few things to note. You've got... Um, oh, yeah. Ah, okay. So, yeah, interestingly, a little bit about Lawrence Lee's other work. I may need to jump on my notes in just a minute. Um, so one question I had was, why do we, why get rid of the mullions and the tracery? Why get, destroy that stonework and put in one big window? Uh, and I, w I was wrestling with this question, and I thought, and I had a look at some of Stephen Lee's other work. I thought, maybe he just didn't do that kind of stuff. But actually, this is uh, an example of one of his windows uh, in Kent. Uh, here's another one called The Sun and the Earth. And I really like this one, actually. I think, so I did a couple of close-ups. You can see the vibrant colors that he uses and uh, this kind of abstract style that's quite iconic for Lawrence Lee. You've got the earth there and angelic beings doing their thing. Um, he also, interestingly, did a window, a Tadeum Laudamus window, which was the very window that uh, Hickson suggested that we fill our east window with. So um, it's not that he couldn't do them, clearly. Uh, it's just that, for whatever reason, it was decided to do something else. Also, what's really interesting is... Um, our window is called Christ in Majesty, and Lawrence Lee actually did at least three other Christ in Majesty windows in other churches in the world. Um, this is one in Sutton. It's very different to ours in a lot of respects. This is one in, uh, is it Sunbridge? And this one's very similar to ours. This is in Cuddington. The Jesus figure, at least, is very similar. One thing I love about his work is um, he includes a whole variety of tones. You get quite large areas that are solid color, such as you know St. Paul's robes or Mary's robes or Jesus vestments, um, and yet it's just not one tone of red. It's a whole like range, a whole spectrum of reds or a whole spectrum of blues uh, that compose up these areas. I think it makes it very beautiful. So back to our window. Um, Jesus is seen wearing vestments. So, uh, so a few things to notice. First of all, We've kind of given the overview. When looking at Paul, we'll notice that he's standing where St. John would normally stand in a traditional image of Christ with Mary, uh, probably from the crucifixion reference where he says to John, John, this is your mother, this is your son. Um, normally when that kind of scene is painted, it's John and Mary standing there, not Paul. Obviously, he's been swapped out for our namesake. Um, and Paul is offering uh, Christ a sword, and we can't see the tip of the sword. Um, and whether that rec uh, represents the violence or the word or whatever it is that's often associated with Paul, he's offering it to Jesus. Mary um, doesn't have stars around her halo. Instead, she is holding a lily, a symbol associated with her and again, also seen in our aisle windows on this side, somewhere, um, and in some of our stone carvings that we looked at last week. Jesus is wearing vestments, not robes of his day. These are Anglican vestments. And interestingly, he's wearing red now, red is only allowed to be worn on certain times, and since we're the most non-Anglican Anglican church I can think of, I thought I'd better explain to you <laughs> what the significance of a red vestment is. Uh, so, um, red is only allowed to be worn, the, the red vestments are to be worn on Palm Sunday and Good Friday, which obviously link to the cross image in the background of the image, of the, of the picture. Also on Pentecost, linked with the Holy Spirit above Jesus. And at the Feast of the Martyrs and the Apostles and the Evangelists, which is exactly what all of our aisle windows are. So it's the perfect color vestments for Jesus to be wearing. Normal vestments are white for, uh, re uh, sorry, for commemorative days or green for regular Sundays. So I think there's a significance in them being red. Also, the Holy Spirit icon is a dove, but it's quite abstract. We have it here? Here we go. So it's a bit of an abstract dove. Um, it's not that, again, Lawrence Lee couldn't do the classic-looking dove, or as Evan Lewis likes to call it, the kamikaze pigeon. Because <laughs> these are all examples of Lawrence Lee's windows around the world where we have exactly that thing going on. But we do see his, uh, his, more, his preferred option, which is this kind of abstract version of the dove, this kind of weird, spiraling, flame-ridden dove. Here's a close-up that you can, is a little bit clearer that you can see from his, also his Christ in Majesty window in uh, Sutton. Um, and again, from Stephen Lee, he told me that 
Um, his, father, his father's favorite evocation of the Holy Spirit came from T.S. Eliot's lines in the poem Little Gidding, where it says, the dove descending breaks the air with flame of incandescent terror, of which the tongues declare the one discharged from sin and error. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of pyre of pyre to be redeemed from fire by fire. And so there's this lovely mix in our Holy Spirit image of the mix of the dove and the, the descending flame. <coughs> so we've got the Holy Spirit very clearly, we've got Jesus very clearly, um, but you might be asking, well, well, then where is God? And we kind of have this um, myriad of color beneath the feet of Jesus. And uh, I was asking this question to myself, and I started having a look at the window in a little bit more detail, section by section, so I could pull out some of the gems, and, uh, and I noticed something. Now, it's quite hard to see in this picture, so I'm just going to reduce the saturation for you. And it's still a little hard to see, so I'm going to highlight the lines. Hidden there in those colors, beneath Jesus, is the eye, the eye of divine providence. Now, before you start throwing holy water and Jerusalem oils at our east window, <laughs> uh, the eye of divine providence, although it's often now associated with things like Freemasonry or the Illuminati, was originally a Christian symbol from the time of the Renaissance. Here it is, the eye in the triangle. This is a Renaissance painting from, is it 1525, I think? Yeah. Uh, and it was a symbol of the Trinity. It wasn't until 1782 that, uni that the United States incorporated the eye on the reverse of their great seal, and it's subsequently been kind of uh, intrinsically linked with secret organizations. But it is still actually a valid and widely used symbol of God in the church throughout the world today. There's another example from another window. So um, Stephen Lee was thrilled to hear that the eye had been spotted. He said, the eye of God is something my father put in many windows, often in the same abstract way that he did in your window. Oh. Uh, he was exceedingly well-versed in Christian iconography and in many other religious and secular symbolic systems, which is why what looks like pure abstraction is often based on symbolism in subtle ways. So we'll go to another thing, incidentally, is there's no feet in the picture. Not sure how that's relevant, but there we go. Um, and there's kind of this impression of the cross shape with like these squares along the way, but actually the cross extends beyond those squares right to the perimeter of the window. So um, I'm not sure whether they're sort of like cross points since Mary and Paul stand directly beneath them and kind of in them, uh, or whether what's behind all three of the central characters is actually an open Bible. Um, it looks a bit that way to be a Bible here and kind of open pages, and there's kind of some curving lines here that suggest pages opening, uh, or it could just be all part of this general ellipse shape, which is, uh, again, very common in Anglican churches, and we have several of them around. But it's cool, isn't it? You can see the eye now. Now that you've seen it, you'll only be able to see it. Some other really cool things about this window is that um, Lawrence Lee blends two different colors on one pane, and this is pretty unusual. Um, some have uh, a reduced amount of pigment, essentially a red that fades out, but here you get reds that fade into yellows uh, and other colors that fade into alternative colors. He also has this idea where he uses lead lines to paint an image, and then he kind of stops the lead lines but continues to paint them on the subsequent panes and then gradually fades them out. And uh, you can see that done very uh, clearly here, where this, this line here is entirely painted, and then this one here is lead line up until that point, and then it's painted. And these ones, you can see where the painting is almost faded. They kind of, the lead line stops there, and then uh, the painting goes on from that. And I think that it just kind of allows the whole lines to just kind of flush out and fade out. Uh, and gives you an impression that you couldn't do if you weren't using the paint as well as the lead lines. So there we go, that's our east window, Christ in majesty. His son summarized, uh, it's very typical of my father's best windows of the time where the figures are integrated with an abstract background. In this window, Christ's cloak is as much abstract as figurative. The cross is also abstracted and its geometry is used as part of the background design. But that's not the only window in our chancel. We have one more set to talk about, and then you can give your brain a break. Uh, and these are the Patterson windows. And uh, these are very much memorial windows. And uh, I will tell you the story of John Patterson. So John Patterson came from a wealthy family. He was um, educated at Eton College and Oxford University. He was athletic. He was an excellent cricketer, and he discovered a keen interest for languages. He learned German, Latin, Arabic, and Hebrew, and he was ordained into the priesthood 
at Exeter Cathedral in 1854 when he was 27. That same year, Patterson met with Bishop Selwyn, who had actually been a classmate of his at university. And uh, he recruited him for, as in Selwyn recruited Patterson, for work in New Zealand. And they came here, arriving in Auckland in 1855. Patterson spent five years touring the Pacific Islands in the schooner, the Southern Cross. He visited the indigenous people and taught them about Christianity. This is him. Um, he also ran the Melanesian mission station built at Koimaramar, educating a number of boys that came to live there in groups. Uh, this here is... Oh yeah. On February 24th in 1861, Patterson was ordained the first Bishop of Melanesia by Bishop Selwyn and the Bishops of Nelson and Wellington at a special service held at St. Paul's Church. And uh, this is the newspaper entry for that uh, event. Now, as the official Bishop of, the, uh, of Melanesia, Patterson resumed his challenging mission. Uh, it was a, a very challenging parish covering about 1,800 miles of ocean uh, and hundreds of islands filled with often hostile natives, um, also largely due to something called blackbirding. Uh, blackbirding is basically like press gangs. They would rock up to an island and they would in, you know, entice men to come on board the boat and they would force them into um, forced labor. So they were also known as snatch snatch boats and they would impress young boys and men into, yeah, into these services. On one occasion, Patterson and his assistants were shot at with arrows while leaving Santa Cruz. Two of his assistants were wounded and later died because the arrows had been poisoned. So it was a very dangerous position and uh, being a bishop wouldn't necessarily save you. Patterson's interest in languages grew to a linguistic brilliance. He spoke 23 of the Melanesian languages and printed grammars and vocabularies and translated the gospel into Mota, the most widely learned dialect. He was tall and athletic with a grave but gentle face. On the islands, where he went, he went barefoot, only wearing a shirt and trousers rolled up to the knee. And when visiting a new island with potentially hostile natives, he did as Selwyn taught him, to swim ashore wearing a top hat, filled with gifts for the people. And he made friends with the villagers quickly, gave them gifts, learned their names and enough of their language to use again on his return. And when he would return, months or sometimes years later, he would use their names and their dialects. And this was a really great way that he built rapport with the, uh, the indigenous people. Patterson's main aim was to take the boys from the villages to the mission station at Koimarama. Um, we kind of have a few buildings down in Mission Bay still, so named because of the mission that was based there. Um, there were also two large pines that used to be down there. Um, they were also planted in memorial of British Patterson uh, around the 1870s. Sadly, they had to chop one down a few years ago. Um, so, so Patterson would take these boys back to the mission station and he would educate them, uh, he would obviously Christianize them, and the aim was to, uh, to, to place them in s back on their original island so that they could educate other people and spread the gospel. Uh, and Patterson was like uh, Hobson in the way that he saw the Melanesian um, people as equals um, and didn't kind of look down on them or treat them any differently than he would a white person. Uh, Patterson also devoted his family fortune to the Melanesian mission, including the inheritance from his father and income from his fellowship at Merton. He raised funds from British colonists in Sydney, and vicars at St. Paul's often made appeals for funds for the mission frequently. Uh, in September 1871, Bishop Patterson was on his way to the Solomon Islands. Uh, when he wrote to his sisters, I am fully alive to the probability that some outrage has been committed here by one or more vessels. The master of the vessel that Atkins saw did not deny his intentions of taking away, as from these, as, as from any other islands, any men or boys he could induce to come on board. I am quite aware that we may be exposed to considerable risk on this account, but I don't think there is very much cause to fear. And it goes on about how he's already friends with these people, and they know him, and every reason why he should be fine. But arriving at the island of Nukapu, five canoes came out and stopped short of the Southern Cross. Patterson and a small crew boarded a rowboat and went to go meet them. The tide was too low for the Southern Cross to get any closer. Patterson got into the canoe with two other chiefs that he knew well, and they departed for the shore. But as soon as he was out of sight, the other boats started attacking the, uh, the crew on the rowboat. It took them a little while to get out of arrow range, and by that point, uh, Reverend Atkin, the Patterson's assistant, had been hit in the shoulder, and John and Stephen, two native station graduates, 
uh, Native Mission Station graduates, sorry, uh, had been pierced in the side, and Stephen had been pierced with six arrows, respectively. The, wounds, uh, the wounded men were loaded on the Southern Cross, and a rescue party was immediately launched to fetch the bishop. But before the rescue boat could even get past the reef, another two canoes set off from the island. One returned, and the other was left adrift. The rescue boat pulled alongside the drifting boat and found the body of Bishop Patterson wrapped in palm matting with a palm frond in his hand knotted in five places. Patterson's clothes had been stripped, his head badly smashed, and his body was wounded in several places. Reverend Atkin, Stephen, John, and another native boy all died from their wounds over the next few days, and all five were buried at sea. Now, it later emerged that a few days prior to Patterson arriving, um, five Nakapu men had been abducted and another had been killed by blackbirders. So the attack was either one of revenge, mistaking him for a blackbirder, or because Patterson also took boys away for long periods of time and the islanders may not have considered there to be too much difference. Either way, Bishop Patterson's death was associated with native resistance to the abuses of the blackbirders. In England, it sparked a righteous anger, increased interest both in missionary work and an improvement in the working conditions of the laborers in Melanesia. One newspaper I read from Auckland said that 5,000 pounds had been donated to the Melanesian mission in response, and 44 men had volunteered to be missionaries uh, in the Malaysian field. Uh, the British government also took active measures to stamp out the slave trade in the Pacific territories. John Patterson was labeled as a proto-martyr for the Melanesian mission. He celebrated in the Anglican Church as a lesser saint on the 20th of September, the date of his death. The Daily Southern Cross commented, it may be that the last event in the valued life of Bishop Patterson will prove the means of sweeping away forever the sore evil under which the islands suffer. And of course, which he worked so hard to try and do something about. So that's Bishop Patterson. And opposite him is this guy, a guy called George Sarawai, or George Sarawia. And he was the first Melanesian to be ordained into the priesthood. Uh, George wrote his memoirs in a short account called They Came to My Island. So he comes from here. He's from a place called Mota. And uh, so these are the Solomon Islands. And this is a zoom in on that previous image. And then that's a zoom in on the other one. And you can see Mota is there. So it gives you an idea of the huge scale that Patterson was supposed to be the bishop over all of these islands. I think this is now in an area that we call Vanuatu. So this is uh, his memoirs. They came to my island. And uh, he recalls a number of uh, instances when he first met white men, which was Patterson and Selwyn. And some of them quite humorous. He says, I saw Bishop Selwyn standing by the side and I was afraid of him because he was wearing black clothes, but his face was very white. We thought the white men were some of our own people who had died long ago and had come to life again in the land that they had sailed from. And I looked at the feet of the people on the ship and I thought it was really their feet, but it was only the leather shoes they were wearing. And I said to myself, these men were partly made of clamshell, and my bones quaked. <laughs> George eventually went to New Zealand with Bishop Patterson on his, after his third visit. And Patterson invited him the first time, and he refused to go with him. And when he returned, he assured him, and he said, see, George, if you had come with me the first time, I would be taking you home today. Uh, and he still refused to go with them a second time. But after his third visit, George agreed to go with him to the mission station. Uh, and in his memoirs, he writes about essentially seeing what Auckland is like. This is uh, George, incidentally. And, uh, and he's, he, he, he writes typically of someone essentially awestruck by an advanced world. Um, but my highlights were these lines, and he says, I saw too a great crowd coming together on Sundays in a big church, St. Paul's. When the people came in, the bell stopped ringing, and then he goes on to describe the service. But George remembers seeing St. Paul's when he first came to Auckland. George Sarawai returned to his home in Mota in 1868 and set up a model school and a Christian village. He continued to train for ordination, was made a deacon by Patterson in 1868, so three years before he died. Patterson actually gave a lovely little account of George in a letter he wrote to his cousin. He said, my dear cousin, I must write you a few lines about our great event of yesterday. George Sarawai was ordained deacon in our little chapel in the presence of 55 Melanesians. It was in the year 1857 that the bishop and I first saw him at Vanua Lava Island, <coughs> and he's been with us now for 10 years. I can truly say that he has never given me any uneasiness. He is not the cleverest of our scholars, but no one possesses the confidence of all of us in the same degree. True, he is the oldest of the party, but it is his character rather than his age which gives him his position. 
For a long time, he has been our link with the Melanesians themselves, whenever there was something to be done by one of themselves rather than by us strangers. Somehow, the other scholars get in the way of recognizing him, get into the way of recognizing him as the AI of the place. And so in Mota and the neighboring islands, his character and reputation are well known. The people expect him to be a teacher among them. They all know that he is a person of weight. So George worked and taught tirelessly for 34 years in Mota with his school and his uh, home, uh, gradually spreading the Christian influence over every aspect of the island's life. He became a priest in 1873 and died as an old man in 1901. And it was said at his death that he had a perfect Christian character, that he had modeled, that he had modeled on Bishop Patterson, and that he had lived a consistently good life, never once failing or even appearing to swerve. So when we look at our windows, we see that Lawrence Lee included a number of features relating to the martyrdoms of both Bishop, of, uh, Bishop Patterson. Um, Bishop Patterson here stands in his uh, bishop's robes, and he's holding a cross representing the mission that he had towards Melanesia, and an arrow reflecting the indigenous Malaysians that he served. Beneath him is a shield with a cross and three stars that I'm assuming is his bishop's coat of arms, but I don't have reference for that. George also wears priestly robes and stands in an almost identical position, holding instead a knotted palm frond, the same one that was put into Patterson's hand. His shield has three leaves, and I'm not entirely sure what that relates to. Um, both are a true likeness of the person, both face towards the altar, and both have three abstract spirits above them. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. There you go. Signifying the trinity over their life. Uh, beside them are two trefoil lights, these kind of three-leaf clovers. And again, on the left, we have uh, the sketches by Lawrence Lee and then the actual windows on the right. Uh, one of them, the one next to Patterson, is the Southern Cross ship that uh, was used by the missionaries as they went about the islands. And it's being viewed through the cross that Patterson is holding in the Lancet. The other trefoil is of the canoe, which held the body of Patterson when he was found, and it's viewed through the palm frond that uh, George Sarawaya is holding. The five knots, which is clearer on Lee's cartoon than on the actual image, are those tied into the palm, and they probably represent the five lives lost in the tragedy for us, but the palm itself was knotted in five places to represent the five boys that had been abducted a few days prior. So this stunning set of chancel windows by Lawrence Lee uh, concludes our tour of St. Paul's leaded cathedral and stained glass. And to close this series of talks, I just want to quote from um, an early 17th century poet called George Herbert, and the first stanza of his poem called The Windows. Lord, how can a man preach thy eternal word? He is a brittle, crazy glass. Yet in thy temple that thou dost him afford this glorious and transcendent place to be a window through thy grace. Herbert's question is a familiar one to every age. How can man in all his frailty reflect God in all his glory? We are all flawed like brittle, crazy glass, but it is through that very glass that God will be viewed. So may we, like the beautiful windows that surround us, though brittle and in need of repair, continue to shine as lights in our busy urban setting and tirelessly, tirelessly reflect the stories and nature of God to anyone who sees us. And thank you so much for your attention. I hope you found it helpful. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the Stain Talk. That's our, there are our windows. There you go.